For you IT gurus there in the back of the room, uh, Jeff and uh, Jeremy, we will be beginning in one minute. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, July 27th. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, July 27th. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, July 27th. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, July 27th. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, July 27th. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, July 27th. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Just speak. I know how to do that. Uh, testing, testing, one, two, three, DeKalb City Council, July 27, 2020. Just speak. I know how to do that. Uh, testing, <laughs> testing, one, two, three, DeKalb City Council, July 27. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the July 27 regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council. Good evening, City ladies Council. and gentlemen.
one more. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the July 27 meeting of the DeKalb City Council. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the July 27 meeting of the DeKalb City Council. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the July 27 meeting of the DeKalb City Council. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, July 27, 2020. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the DeKalb City Council, July 27, 2020. meeting of the DeKalb City Council July 26 2020 on this beautiful midsummer's night for meeting of the DeKalb City Council July 26 2020 on this beautiful midsummer's night for meeting of the DeKalb Tonight City we Council are meeting July 26 2020 as free men and women on this beautiful embraced midsummer's by night. In embracing the freedoms that we have as free citizens of the United States by the However, this evening we are not we have free from the dangers and dangers of the
Second. It's been moved by Alderman Finucane, seconded by Alderman McAdams, that in the, or, excuse me, Alderman Smith, uh, that we uh, combine ordinances that we're considering on first reading tonight, L1, 2, and 3 together. At that time, I will read them as one omnibus motion. Any discussion? Roll call. Morris? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. The agenda is approved as amended. Now we get to the item on the agenda, item D, public participation. This is a place where any member of the public, if you're here, we would simply ask that you fill out a speaker request form in the back uh, from uh, Executive Assistant Scott and we will uh, make sure that we get you on. Uh, also, uh, since we do have Zoom at this meeting, we have asked those who uh, are on Zoom and who have indicated with a submission request form that they uh, would like to speak, that we ask them to speak on, on their own tonight um, through the Zoom process. Given the fact that this is the first meeting that we have the Zoom in this room during City Council, there are a few folks who have indicated a desire that they send a letter to us and we would read those letters. We're gonna try to wean ourselves from reading letters and get folks, as long as we're in the Zoom process, uh, to uh, submit the request and then we will get them on during Zoom. Uh, and as is the case with all of our public participation, uh, folks can either speak during this item on the agenda, public participation, or if they would prefer to speak to a specific items, a specific item on which they'd like to address the council, they may wait for that item on the agenda. So if I call you early here under public participation and you would prefer to wait until we get to such item on the agenda, uh, just let me know. Our first member of the public who would like to participate would like his letter read. He did submit this uh, with an online submission form and he asked that we have that letter read. Uh, this is from Herb Rubin, 131 East Alden Place, DeKalb, Illinois. And I am going to ask his alderman, Fifth Ward Alderman Scott McAdams to kindly read Mr. Rubin's letter. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thank the mayor, council, manager, and police chief for their start in addressing the concerns of the Black Lives Matter activists and their supporters. The changes made in police policies, the posting of the police manual, the planned discussion of the police budget are all to the good. But more is needed as many more concerns of BLM and its supporters have not yet been considered. Those include establishing a citizen review board for the police, protecting tenants from the actions of unscrupulous landlords, and demilitarizing of the police, among other matters needed to build trust, improve safety, and enhance racial and economic justice. To continue in this effort, I suggest the following procedures. One, set an immediate date for an extended Cal meeting. Prior to that meeting, city staff with the subcommittee, subcommittee of the council need to go over the extended list provided by the HRC, pulling out those items already accomplished and those out of city jurisdiction, leaving a list of items now needing council consideration. Step two, Cal then meets with one item on the agenda discussing the called list of issues. Council members then decide how to implement these items and propose the content of appropriate ordinances for consideration at the next council meeting. If at that meeting the council cannot work out ways of implementing these items, they should be remanded to the HRC. The HRC in conjunction with leaders of BLM and other concerned parties will meet 
do background research or whatever is needed to promptly come up with the ways of implementing the more complicated items. These proposals are then returned to Council for a vote. Then after the receipt of this second set of recommendations, the Council immediately considers them, working out how to turn them into ordinance from a vote at the next Council meeting. By taking action on the remainder of the ideas of BLM and its supporters, Council will publicly demonstrate that DeKalb is a welcoming community concerned about racial and economic justice. At the end of comments. And Herb did a wonderful job of staying within the three minute limit. Our next uh, participant is Maureen Garrity, 680 Hayes Boulevard in DeKalb. It's a very simple uh, message, very short. Uh, she would like to indicate that Barb City residents and staff would like to make some comments when we reach that point on the uh, agenda this evening. Our next speaker, I believe I saw was on the Zoom, and that is uh, Derek Van Buer. Derek? Derek Van Buer, can you hear us? Derek, you're still on mute. Would you kindly unmute yourself and read your letter, please? Well, I do have a copy of that letter. I'd be happy to read it for Derek. Uh, it has a Excel document a chart, so I don't know how I read that, but I'll do my best. The annual tax increment finance report is attested by the TIF administrator. The TIF administrator attests that the report is completed and accurate pursuant to the Tax Increment Allocation Redevelopment Act. Based on the findings of the ENY report, every annual tax increment finance report is inaccurate for the scope of this project. Every report contains the 9001 transfer to general fund. Therefore, the FY09, FY10, FY11, FY12, FY13, FY14, FY15, FY16, FY16.5, FY17, and FY18 annual tax increment finance reports are inaccurate. Each of these reports contains the attest statement by the TIF administrator. Each of these reports contain the certification letter by the executive, usually the city mayor, in attachment B. Each of these reports contain the certification letter by the city attorney in attachment C. You might have noticed that Bill Nicholas is now the TIF administrator, effective for the 2018 report. Also, the letter by the city attorney, John Donahue, does not seem to comply with the certification requirement. The IRS disallows deductions and expenses not supported by accurate documentation and records. Maybe the Illinois Comptroller should be provided with the E&Y report. And notification of the inaccuracies of the annual tax increment finance reports? Question mark. Maybe the city should send amended annual reports to the Illinois Comptroller? Question mark. The city needs to address how it is going to refund the money that it misspent from the general fund. Signed, Derek Van Buer. Our next letter is from Lori Rodriguez, 931 East Garden Street. And I don't see Lori up on the Zoom, so I'm gonna go ahead and read this. Again, I'd like to emphasize to those folks who uh, would like to uh, take advantage of our city council meetings that if you do uh, intend to participate by Zoom, let us know and we'd like to have you 
uh, read your own letter. This is a very short one from Lori. It is important that you follow through with all of the proposals that were put forth at the previous council meetings. You stated well, but there are many important concerns left to address. Prompt response is needed in order to retain the confidence of the community. We want to be a welcoming, equitable, and responsive community, and this is your opportunity to show that you will not let us down. Please schedule a separate extended COW, which is Committee of the Whole meeting, to address each of the proposals that would be within the city's jurisdiction. Each item needs to be addressed and accounted for, either by proposing and implementing appropriate ordinances or by sending this to the HRC to research the steps that need to be taken to enable implementation at the next meeting. That letter from Lori Rodriguez. We have one other speaker who would like to uh, speak to us, and that person is with us, Mark Charvat. All right, a couple of comments. Uh, first off, I'm not sure if uh, the folks on Zoom are able to participate yet, so hopefully we can find out, because I haven't heard from the city clerk yet, so it may be that folks there cannot participate or they haven't worked out the technical bugs yet. I want to address a couple things. First off, I want to compliment our uh, first ward alderman, Carolyn, and our sixth ward alderman, Mike, for having ward meetings, keeping their campaign promises. It's my hope that our third ward alderman will continue to honor his previous promise, but we're still waiting on that third ward meeting. Um, quick note, I want to echo upon Mr. Van Buren's comments that were read into the record earlier regarding the TIF reports. And I happen to have a copy of it right here. These are the documents Mr. Van Buren was talking about that were signed by our mayor and our city manager and sent to the state of Illinois in 2019 for the 2018 TIF report. They attested to the following, and I'll read exactly what the mayor signed on his document. It says, the city of DeKalb was in compliance with the Tax Increment Allocation Devel Redevelopment Act in the Central TIF District for fiscal year 2018. And as we know from the report that was uh, commissioned by the state's attorney, the city was not in compliance. This is the same thing as signing your tax return and having false information on there. The document that was signed by our mayor and our city manager is not true. You guys submitted something that was not true. And it's kind of like if you do your taxes and you have an accountant do your taxes, you're signing it. You're responsible for those taxes, not the accountant. So there is an issue here with trust. Um, I also want to bring up the fact that I'm not going to be here for the latter, latter part of the meeting regarding the water tower. We really need to get an explanation as to why this water tower painting project is $200,000 more than the one that was done in 2018. I appreciate Mr. Smith for bringing this up at the last meeting. Same scope, same project size. Why did the project cost go from $550,000 to $780,000 for the same exact project? I do encourage the council when it's... Thank you. Okay, that's all the public participation yeah. forms that we have. Okay, good. Is Maureen on? Yes. Okay, Maureen, yes. hi. Uh, please feel free to make any comments you'd like. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Maureen Garrity, and I have three thank yous from Barb City Manor residents and staff to share with you all. Uh, the first pertains to our sidewalks at the building entrance. One of our residents reached out to Alderman McAdams recently telling him how difficult it was for the residents that use walkers and wheelchairs to navigate the uneven sidewalks in front of the building. Public Works staff responded promptly. In the blazing sun during the hottest week of the summer so far, city workers shaved sidewalk edges and filled cracks in numerous sections. They also replaced a section that had sunk significantly. These repairs have made a huge difference for the residents as they walk to and from the building and they are over the moon with gratitude. Wind damage. Several weeks ago, one of the older trees in the parkway along the Barb City Manor parking lot lost a big limb during a severe windstorm. As it came down, the limb knocked over a nearby street pole. 
City staff from Public Works and the Fire Department cleared the area and roped it off until ComEd could turn off the power to the light fixture. Public Works also made arrangements with a local tree service to safely and efficiently take the tree down. And then flower planters. Andy Rye from Public Works contacted Barb City Manor about two planters that were outside a building that was scheduled for demolition. He wondered if there was a place for them on the Barb City Manor grounds. As it happens, there was a spot near the flagpole outside the building entrance that needed beautification. The shrubs we had planted in the area died this winter from exposure to the salt we used to melt the snow on the adjacent sidewalk. Public Works staff brought the planters to Barb City Manor and installed them. They also brought over surplus annuals and planted them. The flowers are blooming and they are gorgeous. And I just want everyone to know that the city of DeKalb has an extraordinary team of dedicated public servants from top to bottom, and they deserve to be recognized for their efforts. On behalf of the entire Barb City Manor family, please accept my heartfelt thanks. Thank you, Maureen. We appreciate those, those comments. Okay, let's move along now to an item on the agenda, E, presentations. Tonight we have a proclamation. This is the 30th anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act. Uh, it's a lengthy proclamation, but I would like to read a couple of the paragraphs from it, and then I'm going to have it presented to uh, one of our uh, local residents uh, who would also like to make a few comments, I understand. This is a proclamation recognizing and commemorating the 30th anniversary of the enactment of the American with Disabilities Act of 1990. Therefore, be it resolved that the city of DeKalb recognizes and commemorates the 30th anniversary of the enactment of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and be it further resolved that the city of DeKalb encourages agencies, businesses, and all members of the public to celebrate the advancement of the American dream for all made possible by the enactment of the ADA, and be it further resolved that the city of DeKalb pledges to continue to implement the ADA and work on a bipartisan basis to pursue the goals of the ADA, equality of opportunity, full participation, economic self-sufficiency, and independent living for people with disabilities. In witness thereof, I have set my hand and caused the seal of the city of DeKalb to be affixed this 27th day of July, 2020. Tonight, we're presenting this to a second ward resident and a person who has been very, very vocal uh, in our community, and we really appreciate uh, his willingness to step up and tell us how he feels regarding a number of issues in our community, and that's J.J. Wett. I'm going to have his alderman, Bill Finucane, make this presentation to Mr. Wett, whereupon I believe J.J. has a couple of comments he'd like to make. Alderman Finucane. The passing of the ADA was a monumental moment in disabled people's fight for civil rights. And I can attest to that having lived prior to the passing of the ADA. As a toddler, I attended preschool for students with disabilities, predominantly consisting of children and adolescents with intellectual disabilities. I was more than 85, and back then, it was still legal to not accommodate for disabled people. Since I have a physical disability, it was automatically assumed I had an intellectual disability. I finished up preschool at that school, then went out to kindergarten at the grade school I was assigned to, except that I had to go to school the entire day, unlike the other children who went for half a day and went home. I went to quote-unquote regular kindergarten during the morning and went to special education class in the afternoon. The ADA was signed to law in 1990, but not implemented until 91. 
Yes, I have several other stories about accommodations throughout the years, many of which required incessant advocacy on my mother and my part. We have made great advances, yet we have so much further to go. My intention today is not to criticize the ADA or the hard work that went into creating it, but rather to highlight the ways in which our society and our systems must further improve in order to truly protect the rights of disabled people. To supplement my perspective, I spoke to many people with a wide range of disabilities. What follows is a summary of the most crucial improvements to the ADA that the disability community hopes to see in the next 30 years. First is improvement upon enforcement of the ADA. Thanks to the ADA Education and Reform Act of 2017, if a disabled individual feels discriminated against by a private business, they need to endure several months of written correspondence and possible litigation that costs thousands of dollars that generally results in disabled people giving up. Number two, marriage equality for disabled people. Obviously, there's no law explicitly stated that disabled individuals may not get married. However, many disabled individuals rely on government-funded programs to survive. The biggest being caregiving waiver programs through the Department of Rehab Services. To qualify this essential program, an individual cannot exceed a certain amount of assets. If a disabled person marries, their spouse's assets are immediately added to the qualifying equation, making marriage an unrealistic dream for millions who need disability programs to survive. Katie, right here, my fiance and I have openly discussed not getting married just in case it ever interferes the caregiving waiver. Those are not fun nor fair conversations to have. And last, the ADA needs to broaden its oversight. Accessible housing is severely lacking. Airplanes are not wheelchair accessible and exist outside the control of the ADA. And several public transport like subways, buses have avoided requirements that become accessible in hundreds of cities across the U.S. The ADA has been around for 30 years as of yesterday. Without question, its policies have drastically improved our systems surrounding disability, but there's much more work to be done. Within the next 30 years, I hope to see all the above items improved or changed, but above all else, I hope to see disabled people represented at all levels of government. That way, before able people make decisions about disabled people's lives, the disability community is consulted. As far as cons consultation goes, the disability community throughout the city of the county would like to reestablish the Commission on Disabilities which was a subcommittee of the Human Relations Commission back in the early teens. Thank you, and happy Disability Pride Month. Thank you, JJ. And uh, JJ, would you kindly leave a copy of your uh, remarks with uh, Ruth Scott so that we can uh, get those into the record? So thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting uh, this proclamation. <clears throat> Okay, moving in early along, we do have another presentation, and that is the presentation of a check for $1,000 by Hometown Association of Realtors to fund public mural painting under the Lincoln Highway Bridge. I'd like to ask uh, uh, City Manager Nicholas, accompanied by Alder Fifth Ward Alderman Scott McAdams, to make a few words before we uh, accept this hefty check. I'll defer to Alderman Adam McAdams. Scott? Yeah. Um, that we, uh, we were made aware of some um, tagging in the area in which we want to put the mural, and I had reached out to someone who has been asking to do a mural for years. And Aaron Robert, uh, Robertson is a local uh, artist, and he, using our new corporate partner, Facebook, 
put together a group of artists uh, comprised of NIU art students, Shannon Gallagher, Jordan Jacobs, and Ivy Vargas. And then I put a fundraiser on Facebook, and uh, one of my contacts, Neely uh, Erickson, reached out to us uh, with an opportunity for the city to get a $1,000 a check for the, from the Hometown Association of Realtors. And so um, yeah, it's just a pleasure that this all came together using our new corporate partner, and we're very pleased to, to introduce Neely Erickson and to have the presentation. My name is Neely Erickson, and I am the Government Affairs Director for the Illinois Realtors. I'm here on behalf of the more than 300 members of the Hometown Association of Realtors. We appreciate the City Council and staff for reviewing a permit application that will be up for a unity mural at the underpass that connects Northern Illinois University and Prairie Park. Realtors are pleased to support the application for the unity mural and contribute financially to its success. Realtors are committed to fighting racial injustices and championing policies that build safe and inclusive communities. Therefore, the National Association of Realtors created what they call the Community Rebuilding Grant. This grant is to be used by Realtors to help engage with the community and partners and use grant funds towards being a catalyst to leverage change. As some neighborhoods and businesses have suffered vandalism outside of peaceful racial injustice demonstrations across the country, in the city of DeKalb, as Alderman McAdams had mentioned, graffiti was affixed to the underpass wall adjacent to a commonly used pedestrian walkway and bike path. The Hometown Association of Realtors applied for and secured the $1,000 National Association of Realtors Community Rebuilding Grant to assist with the cleanup of graffiti and revitalize the underpass space. I was very impressed when I had seen Alderman McAdams post because rather than merely cleaning up the graffiti, which could further lead to inappropriate tagging of slogans, we decided that I reached out so Realtors could support a collaboration between the city of DeKalb and Off Tracks Gallery with artist Aaron Robertson to design and construct a mural that will focus on diversity and inclusion while recognizing the grave and intense challenges we face as a community today. If the permit application is awarded, Realtors look forward to being a valued partner in the Unity Murals funding and construction. And thank you in advance for your time and consideration of the mural permit application. Thank you to the Hometown Association of Realtors and to Alderman McAdams. Scott, would you like to accept that check? Sure. Thank you again to the Hometown Realtors. Let's give them a hand. Thank you also to our staff photographer, Bill Nicholas, for uh, taking those pictures. Um, okay, we move along now to appointments, item F on your agenda. Uh, in most cases, these items are approved in omnibus form. However, what I'd like to do tonight is to, with the Council's permission, is to uh, take action on number one and number two in omnibus form, I have a vote on that, and then I'd like to comment on item number three. So with that, I'd like to ask your approval for the appointment of Adrian Lu Lopez to the Citizens Environmental Commission for the completion of a two-year term through December 31, 2021 and also appointment of John Walker to the Human Relations Commission for the completion of a three-year term through December 31, 2022. I'd entertain a motion, please. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Verbeek, seconded by Alderman Favor. Any discussion on those two appointments? Roll call, please. Finucane? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. 
Verbeek? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Those two appointments are approved. I purposely left item three on the agenda tonight because we removed it from the agenda last meeting. Uh, there were a number of questions regarding why we did that and I wanted to explain it to the public and explain it to those who may be interested in the appointment. It's the appointment, the reappointment of Joyce Tapasia, who you may recall uh, filled in as uh, uh, acting uh, third ward alderman uh, uh, prior to uh, uh, Tracy Smith being elected. Uh, Joyce uh, is former village president of uh, Villa Park, uh, is very, very interested in, uh, in this matter, has served on police pension boards uh, in other communities, and really does a very, very fine job. But uh, after having this on the agenda at our last meeting, I was told at the last minute at about four o'clock uh, that we had a problem in that since Joyce moved from the third ward to Batavia, she has indicated that she is gonna move back to DeKalb. Uh, she is not eligible, she was not eligible for reappointment to the police pension board. After having talked with our city attorney, I'm told that with a uh, modification on our uh, police pension board uh, ordinances, we can, if this council decides to, uh, change that to allow someone from outside the city of DeKalb to be a reappointed uh, or to be appointed to the police pension board. So I'd like to explain that tonight. We'll bring that back to our next meeting if that is okay with council. Uh, Alderman Morris. So just to clarify, you're saying that she intends to move back to the yes. community? Yes. Mm -hmm. She okay. has no apartment, she has no house yet, but she's indicated that she is going to move back. And uh, so I'm not gonna suggest that we put any, any limit on that or any, any time frame. Uh, Joyce has done such a good job in her role here uh, in the community and I'd hate to lose someone of her capabilities. And in this particular instance, uh, the police pension board requires some training and all that, uh, perhaps m to a greater extent than some of our appointees to boards and commissions might have. So, uh, but again, it's up to the council, it's up to us to consider making a modification to our uh, ordinance for that particular board specific to the police pension board. We'll bring that back to our next meeting. Uh, with that, I would like to just very, very quickly say that uh, I take mayoral appointments to our boards and commissions very, very seriously. Uh, we, we try to do the best job we can to uh, attract folks, to explain what it is they're getting into, if you will, uh, seeing what their, synergy, what their uh, uh, backgrounds and what their skill sets might be as it relates to that uh, uh, to that commission. Um, we have quite a few that are going to be up for reappointments uh, over the next uh, several months, uh, including a number who that uh, expire at the end of December. Uh, and so again, if anyone in our community is interested, or and I would ask council if you know of anyone who might be interested in any of our boards and commissions, we like to see keep sort of a queue, if you will, so we have some folks who, who may be in a position, if, if we don't have an opening immediately, uh, we can make that, uh, uh, take them into consideration when we do have a vacancy, so thank you very much. Okay, moving forward to item G on the agenda. This is the consent agenda. Again, all items on the consent agenda are enacted by one motion. There's no separate discussion unless uh, any of these items is requested to be deleted or further discussed uh, as opposed to the consent agenda. Do I have any, any folks who would like to do that? If not, let me read the consent agenda. Number one, minutes of the Committee of the Whole Meeting of July 13, 2020. Number two, minutes of the regular City Council Meeting of July 13, 2020. Number three, accounts payable and payroll through July 27, 2020 in the amount of $2,391,372.98. Number four, investment and bank balance summary through May 2020. Number five, 
year-to-date revenues and expenditures through May 2020. Number six, FY 2020 Human Services Funding Second Quarter Report. Number seven, Freedom of Information Act, FOIA Report, June 2020. And finally, number eight, Citizens Environmental Commission Annual Report. I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Finucane, seconded by Alderman McAdams. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Faber? Yes. Morris? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. The consent agenda is approved as presented. We have two public hearings tonight, and the first public hearing is Community Development Block Grant 2020 Annual Action Plan Amendment. I'm opening this public hearing at 648. Is there anyone besides City Manager Nicholas who would like to present this report or would like to make any comments during this public hearing? If not, City Manager Nicholas. I'll be brief then, Mayor. Uh, as I point out in the background, uh, we are pleased to report that the uh, federal government through the uh, CARES Act has made available some additional funds for us at our local level. And the City of DeKalb is the CDBG uh, administrator for um, a variety of programs. Um, Joanne Rouse is in the audience tonight is, and is the face and the, the mover and shaker of all of that management for us, and we're very grateful for what she does and for, for uh, finding this in the allocation that went to the state. Uh, we're proposing an expansion of our 2020 public services contracts that the council just saw at the July 13th meeting. This is a good fit for that uh, particular amount of money, as you can see by the table on page three of your background report. There's a little bit left uh, that we, I'm sure, will find um, a, a good purpose for. And if the council has any questions, Joanne or I will attempt to answer them. Any discussion from city council on this particular amendment request during this public hearing? If not, thank you, City Manager Nicholas. I would close this public hearing at 6.50 p.m. Our second public hearing is a proposed annexation and development agreement for approximately 16 acres of property that is generally located along the west side of North Annie Glidden Road across from the DeKalb County Health Facility campus for the DeKalb First United Methodist Church. If there's anyone uh, from the public who would like to speak to this, you're more than welcome to. Otherwise, I'm gonna turn this over to City Manager Nicholas. Okay. Uh, this public hearing uh, addresses a topic which also appears later on in your uh, agenda tonight and the council's already take some action to, taken some action to combine three ordinances. Uh, that deal with the uh, annexation and development agreement, annexation and rezoning and approval of concept plans and so forth for uh, the Cal First United Methodist Church project, which is uh, to be located at the northwest corner of, of excuse me, they're currently at the northwest corner of, of Fourth Street and Oak in the city of DeKalb and are moving to a location off of North Annie Glidden Road, approximately ac across from the DeKalb County Health Facility campus. Uh, this is a project that has been in the planning by the church and, and more recently in the last year, year and a half or so with uh, the city of DeKalb, Dan Olson, our principal planner has been particularly uh, involved in working with the church on this and I've had an opportunity on occasion to also uh, participate. There's a lot of detail here. I'm gonna go through the highlights and we'll be happy to answer any questions. There's been a lot of public input on this. We've had recently two Planning and Zoning Commission meetings to get down to uh, the details about drainage, uh, stormwater potential, stormwater runoff as this project uh, is built, as opposed to its current uh, natural situation and, and other matters. So uh, I, I will do my best to be brief here. Uh, there's 
three pages in your background. Um, the, the specifics are that uh, the, the church is looking to uh, land on roughly uh, uh, just a little bit under a 16 acre site. Uh, a little more than half of that's already been annexed, but what uh, needs to be done is to rezone the whole site uh, under a planned development residential designation. The, uh, the property uh, sets up well for this type of, of facility. There's lots of setback and uh, yard area to uh, highlight the, the uh, architecture of the church. Uh, it's, it's planned to have a, a sanctuary as well as, as a lot of, of uh, space for the congregation uh, to uh, have coffee, to, to have uh, Sunday school, to have uh, community meetings, uh, there'll be a kitchen, administrative offices, and so forth. It will be accessed from Annie Glidden Road. There is a future uh, road that would be dedicated to the city with the approval of this project, it would be called Beautiful Gate Drive. It would run uh, east and west from Annie Glidden West to uh, the west point of the property on the north boundary line of the property. What's proposed is that within this right of way, there will be a driveway as you would normally have for a church. There were at this time, because it's a not for profit and a lot of fundraising has gone into getting them to this point, there's more fundraising to do eventually. Uh, to, if, if there is further development west of the church, uh, possibly to do some further improvements. But for now, we thought it was, would have been uh, certainly out of the ordinary and, and uh, uh, financially infeasible to ask them to put that road through all the way, according to the city specs, for a curb and gutter uh, road, 36-foot uh, uh, curb to curb and so forth. So they're looking to put in a two-way uh, drive with a turn lane as it gets to Annie Glidden to afford safe left-hand turns onto Annie Glidden. Uh, this is, is not unusual for a project such as this and it's squarely within the right-of-way that's proposed for this future uh, minor uh, collector street. Uh, also, the, the project concept plan uh, is looking for some waivers, and I highlighted those in the background. They all seem very reasonable to our staff and also seem very reasonable to the Planning and Zoning Commission. I'll just touch on them very briefly. Um, our, our height regulations in a residential uh, neighborhood don't contemplate a um, residential building 86 feet high, but there is a steeple on this, on this church, and so naturally uh, there is going to be a, a breach of the, of the upper height limit and they're looking for a uh, waiver of the UDO requirement there. It makes sense, there's plenty of setback here. If there was a catastrophic uh, accident, it wouldn't be falling on any adjacent houses or properties. Landscaping, they're proposing to do a lot of landscaping, but our, our uh, UDO is very uh, aggressive when it comes to landscaping uh, because, for instance, their parking lot will probably be expanded as time goes along. We're not asking that they put in some of the elaborate landscaping around the area that the, the um, parking lot would be expanded into, for instance. But the church is, has been involved in fundraising not only for the construction of the church, but also for all the appurtenances and features that go with it, including landscaping. Uh, they would landscape the, the um, uh, medians in the parking area around the church itself. Uh, there's just some additional landscaping that they'd like some time to raise some money on. We thought that was reasonable. Again, the plan commission did as well. Um, talked a little bit about the street, uh, parking lot standards. Uh, if, if the parking lot was to be, it was, let's say it was surrounded, uh, not unlike the lot that just went in at first and Locust, for instance, in the city of DeKalb, then uh, it's the, the environment that will eventually be collecting uh, stormwater runoff is well known. It's not going to change. We require the curbing to be put in at the time that the paving is put in. In this case, I've just alluded to the fact, and there's a lot of background that alludes to the fact that uh, they hope to uh, have uh, room to expand that parking as they may need to. And so we have not require the curbing around it, there's plenty of land area there to absorb, naturally absorb the runoff from the, 
uh, uh, parking lot itself. Uh, there also was a problem that was identified by some of the residents of Eden's Garden with uh, s some uh, uh, areas to just to the, it would be on the west edge of this uh, proposed church property and the east edge of, uh, the northeast edge of, An of Eden's Garden that uh, had some trap water and there was concern obviously by residents in Eden's Garden, is, this, is it going to get worse if this uh, complex is built, if the facility is built, and I uh, thank our public works uh, department for helping all of us uh, figure out what the source of the problem was. Uh, there had been some vegetation that had grown into some of the drain lines and one of the catch basins that had been installed when Nina's Garden was constructed and hadn't been cleaned out on a regular basis. We cleaned them out just to show what might happen and within a few hours a lot of the trap water ran through the pipe system uh, that had been installed years ago in Eden's Garden and so uh, that that relieved some of the concern. Uh, obviously we've, we've uh, got uh, more hurdles ahead when the concept plans become actual uh, blueprints for uh, the, uh, the building of the facility and the site. Uh, there's another process that will involve the plan planning and zoning commission and so we'll we'll all have a chance to see uh, any final uh, adjustments and thoughts about stormwater runoff, as well as other engineering concerns. And so we, we feel that uh, m more than uh, normal due diligence has been uh, sought in the uh, review of this proposal. So uh, I'll, I'll wait on the recommendation until we get to that on the agenda. Yeah, thank you, City Manager Nicholas. This project, uh, if approved, uh, will add considerably uh, to uh, our DeKalb community. I see its senior pastor, Jonathan Crail, is here with us, along with some of his uh, stalwart members, Tom Weber and Jim Horn and Herb Ewer. Thank you, gentlemen, for all the work you've done on this project. And uh, if you'd like to stay there and be the cheerleaders as this city council uh, considers this uh, uh, later on in the meeting, feel free uh, to do that. Uh, with that, I will close this, excuse me, uh, Alderman Morris. I just have uh, one question. In your background, City Manager Nicholas, it says the right of way for the proposed access roadway, Beautiful Gate Drive, will be dedicated to the city with the approval of the project. What exactly does that mean? So I was describing what would be a minor collector that would eventually go from Annie Glidden to some point west and take traffic through. So the right of way is, is everything um, including the uh, um, parkways that will eventually, enough width that would include the parkways, the actual s street and curb and gutter and so forth. 66 feet, is that right, Dan? 66 foot. So that dedication is done, so we don't have to go back later. I, this, is, this wouldn't happen with this group, but it's happened in, in the history of DeKalb. Um, I can attest to this from the 90s that uh, there were assurances made, but they were never done at the time of annexation and rezoning. And then later on when the city said, well, there's, there's an interest in further development beyond your area. Can you give us the right of way to get through? And the answer was no. So we get the right of way. They build their uh, driveway within that right of way, but don't have to build the street. Someday that street will be built by others, or, or maybe there will be participation by the church, but at this point, it's not necessary to define that. As long as we have the right of way, we were assured that there will be access if we want it. Okay. Does that make sense? So the city is basically reserving the right to that Correct. space. Got it. Um, I, I just had residents. And the right of way. It'll be, in, it'll be ours owned um, okay. by the right of way. Okay. Because I had residents who were very concerned about that being built, and so I just want to make sure that. That'll be under your control. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments before we close this uh, public hearing? The public hearing, which started at 6.50, will end at 7.02. Okay, now we move along on our council agenda to considerations. Consideration of a provisional schedule for the review and adoption of the FY 2021 city budget. City Manager Nicholas, please. Thank you, Mayor. I've laid out a schedule for the adoption of this year's, or the next year's uh, 
uh, fiscal year budget, although this year's process leading up to that adoption. And uh, it, it uh, patterns the process that the council liked last year and uh, begins in uh, less than a month, uh, just a day off of what it did last year. It's a joint meeting of the council and finance advisory committee. Uh, it's an off week for council meetings and uh, rather than do the all day type of retreat, which didn't turn into an all day retreat, uh, put it as a, a large workshop basically on Monday the 17th to cover those funds that we, uh, they're the heart really from the standpoint of our residents of our city services and budget, the general fund obviously that has all the operating departments in it, uh, the capital funds that uh, people are most familiar with because they provide the money for streets and, and other uh, capital projects. Uh, through the year, uh, both TIF funds and then our pension obligations. And that's plenty to, to chew on, as we know from last year. And uh, unlike last year, uh, we are, we are um, reaching in the dark in a lot of respects because uh, when, we, when we had even just a few months uh, under our belt in the calendar year, the fiscal year, uh, we could see some early trends and compare year on year from the previous year and know about where we were in state shared revenue. Uh, right now, not only don't we have that, we can't make real hard uh, assumptions because we only have at this point May numbers from the state. We know what COVID was like in May. April was bad. March was the beginning. Uh, April was pretty bad. May, uh, even worse. What is June going to be like as businesses were starting to expand? Are we going to see a, a significant tick up or not? That will have a lot to do with in, in July. Of course, we won't know until almost October. So um, I'm going to do the best I can with the staff we have and present you with as many um, data points as we can and trend lines and so forth like we did last year. Realizing that uh, dates change and schedules change, I think what our city manager Nicholas may be looking for here is simply a consensus that the provisional schedule that he's outlined here on the 27th of July, uh, starting uh, with the first meeting there in, on August 13th, does that make sense to city council? Have some consensus that provisionally it's okay? So it looks pretty good to city manager Nicholas. Okay. Okay. As, as the mayor said, as things can come up. Hopefully it's nothing like COVID, but whatever right. it is, we'll deal with it and we'll, we'll adjust and I'll, right. I'll work with you and your schedules. Thank you. Our second consideration this evening is the biannual review of the compensation of elected officials. And I'd like city manager Nicholas to address this item, please. I just wanted to alert the council to a, a threshold that's, that's coming up. We have a little bit of time to discuss and make decisions, but not a lot of time. Uh, the uh, spring elections are going to be on April 6th in 2021 by state statute. Uh, we have uh, to, uh, we have a 180 day window as I outlined in my background, which uh, is, is the limit. Uh, it, once we get within that window, then we can't, uh, uh, you can't change the compensation, uh, your compensation or, or that of the city clerk. So uh, we have until October 8th to make that decision. A couple meetings, uh, I put this on here just to uh, make you aware. Uh, I, I also couldn't help but resist, or, or not to resist the, the opportunity to just point out to you that as you'll probably see, I'm not gonna say too much now publicly, as you'll probably see on this, in the middle of August that I am going to be recommending some really tough budget decisions. And um, I, I don't know that you'll want to be among the few, if any, who work for the city of DeKalb to be getting pay increases in the next year, the next season. So what we're looking here, uh, city council I think is uh, take a look at uh, the compensation of, uh, of elected officials, most of whom are sitting around uh, this, these tables right now. Uh, and we need to 
uh, have some decision, and we, had, we would hope that we would have some public input on this uh, prior to the first uh, date, what's that, October 8th, mm -hmm. and that's the beginning of that 180-day window prior to the uh, certification of the election of uh, 2021. So any discussion on that now? Uh, city manager, or excuse me, uh, <laughs> Alderman <laughs> Fanukin. Alderman to, Fanukin. Uh, give me your promotion right now, please. Yeah, all right. Uh, uh, my thoughts on this are, and I you know, said it uh, each time we've looked at this, mostly the last couple of times, is that uh, I don't think any of us up here are in this for the money, but particularly in light of the crisis we are facing with the budget due to COVID and, and other things that uh, I'm not looking forward to approving any kind of a salary increase for any of the elected officials. Uh, just for the general public, uh, as the state law reads out is that um, you can't change a salary in the middle of a term. So the immediate impact would be on the election for next spring, and that'd be wards two, four, and six, and the mayor's uh, salary. And it would not impact one, three, five, and seven until after the following election in 23. But at this point, I cannot see us uh, approving any kind of a salary increase for the elected officials at this point. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, moving right along then, let's move along to item K, excuse me, J on our uh, agenda tonight, resolutions. Uh, number one, resolution 2020-074, awarding a bid to Seven Brothers Painting Incorporated in the amount of $710,000, $710,100, for painting and repair of the South Water Tower with staff authority to approve change orders for a total project cost up to $734,954. This was postponed from July 13, 2020, our last meeting. Uh, to get this on the table, I would entertain a motion that we, or would entertain a motion for discussion on this resolution. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Favor, seconded by Alderman Verbeck. City Manager Nicholas, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm gonna uh, present this to you if we have any really detailed questions, uh, like a couple of the ones that were asked from the uh, floor tonight. Uh, Brian Favor's in the audience, our Director of Utilities and Transportation, and and uh, is most intimately involved in terms of our upper management and, and the water system. And he's also here to answer any questions you may have. So, as the mayor said, uh, this was held over and uh, you've uh, agreed to consider it tonight. Uh, the background that you've had for uh, four, four or five days uh, is changed in that uh, we have the written information that Mr. Gettle had presented to you orally uh, it's been attached to your background as well as uh, a written response, a, a, a extended response from the operations manager of Seven Brothers Painting. Uh, in addition, there is a very detailed staff memorandum from Brian Faber in the background. So I, I think we've, we've kept you up to date in terms of the, the information that's out there and available. And I'll, I'll just say that, as I said in the background, I think there are three options that you have. There may be variations of these, but one is to just pick up uh, where we began last time and uh, consider uh, awarding the contract to the apparent little bidder. Uh, another is to, uh, if, if you um, believe that there is, is credibility to the, the safety concerns or if you otherwise are, are concerned about price and, and safety and you'd like to uh, throw the bids out, uh, you, you can do that. Or you can obviously award to the, if you don't want to award to Seven Brothers, you could award to LC United, but that's uh, another $181,000 above what the budget was. Uh, I am recommending that you throw out these bids and then we go to bid again in, in the winter time, probably late January, early February which is the hungriest time of the year for contractors who are looking to start their season. And I think we'll still get aggressive bids. Here we are bidding at the peak of the construction season, and I think that's affected the height of some of these prices. You have the right to do this. 
There's another consideration that Brian told me about last week as we were catching up, uh, and, and uh, Brian felt badly that he wasn't here. I don't think it materially changed things one way or another, but he, he, he's a very dedicated employee, as I said here uh, two weeks ago, and has advised me that in addition to the painting, there is another complication at that tower that will occur, needs to occur, as much as the painting does this year because there's a pump that's, that's uh, uh, not operating properly and it needs to be replaced. Now we happen to have, as we have, thanks to Brian's uh, uh, management, we usually have a spare pump, we do, but it's not like changing the pump in your sump pump at home. We don't just flip a lid, take one out, throw one in. Now this is down 400 feet, it's in casing. We have to get a rig to get inside here and to raise the pump out. And sometimes when that happens, we find that the casing has holes in it and then we have to replace the casing and so forth. And that goes to a, a, a firm away from the site. This is a, th you know, probably a three week process if all goes well, maybe longer if it doesn't. Uh, we did this, I think, Brian, at another, was it, was it last year that we did it? Yeah, and we do. In fact, some of you may remember we had some pictures, and that did not go so well. And we had lined up lots of, you know, 16-foot long sections of 18-inch pipe or whatever it is. So uh, that should be done this year. And here's why: uh, we had talked last time about the importance of having uninterrupted water flow, uh, quality water flow, as we promised to Ferrara. Uh, we get that done now, that's not going to be a problem as they get going. Now, we would have to take the tower out, but not necessarily the pump. We'll have plenty of pressure there. So we'd like to recommend, actually, the third option, which is to throw out the bids and proceed to uh, bid again in, say, late January. I just want to make sure that we're doing this in the proper form, uh, and I'll ask our city attorney, we have a motion on the floor in a second that we award the bid to Seven Brothers Painting. Can we go ahead and uh, exercise one of the options or recommend one of the options if it is not, in fact, awarding the bid to the low bidder, uh, or should we defeat this resolution and then bring a new uh, resolution back on the floor? Yes, Mayor, thank you. I would suggest that we first vote down the current motion that's on the table. Right. And then from that point, I can state a, a sample motion that the city council right. can then use. That, that would make it cleaner. Um, Alderman Verbig. Yeah, thank you for all the detail on this. Uh, I see this as an opportunity. I was chatting with Alderman McAdams the other day and uh, thinking about the water tower on Dresser Road where we have home of the barbs and partner with the school district well wouldn't it be terrific on this one to have uh, participation or cooperation with Ferrara and Facebook uh, perhaps uh, they would want to have their logo up on the tower and uh, would want to contribute toward making that happen so uh, as challenging as this has been I think that there could be some opportunities here to really show how important this partnership is Any other comments? Uh, Alderman Favor. Yeah, I will just say after talking with, uh, with Brian and uh, the city manager, looking at the requirement to replace the pump and not, you know, what's stated here, not being able to go ahead with rebidding to get, to get all of that done. Plus, I, I think as well, if we can move this to next year, if it doesn't really have to be done this year, uh, in our budget. We don't need to spend the money this year. Uh, this would be a good year to put something off until next year. So I'm, I'm okay with option three as well. So we have a motion on the floor that we approve this bid to Seven Brothers Painting. A yes vote would do that. A no vote would defeat that resolution at which point we might want to introduce a new resolution. Any further discussion? Roll call please. McAdams? No. Verbic? No. Faber? No. Morris? No. Finucane? No. Smith? No. Motion fails. 
No. Okay. Um, I'd entertain a motion to move forward uh, with one of the options that were provided to us. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'd like to uh, make the motion that uh, we authorize the city manager to rebid this project uh, out of the FY21 budget, uh, directing him to release the RFP either in late 2020 or early 2021, uh, including the phrase uh, pursuant to passage of the FY21 budget. And that is option three, is that correct? Mayor, b before we do that, my suggestion would be that at the beginning of Alderman Finucane's motion, we add formally add a, as a part of that, the state we're rejecting all bids for the uh, South Water Tower painting and repair check, uh, project, and then directing staff to, you know, continue on with this motion. I accept your language, Council. So the motion is to reject all bids and to entertain and vote on option three as provided by our city manager. We have a motion on the floor from the city from uh, Alderman Fanukan. Second. We have a second from Alderman Favor. Any further discussion? Roll call. Verbic? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Fanukan? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. That will be brought back then as a another resolution at a later time. Okay, another resolution, number two, resolution 2020-078, authorizing an addendum for engineering services with Fair Graham and Associates LLC for the 2020 General Street Maintenance Program as part of the 2019 three-year services agreement with a fee for FY 2020 not to exceed $100,000. Motion, please. So, so moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Verbeek, seconded by Alderman McAdams. City Manager Nicholas, please. Uh, Mayor, just to add uh, that I think this is a, a very generous offer by the engineering firm. Mm -hmm. uh, we, they could have said, we've got a three-year deal pay us 165, they said no, 100, and actually that's a little less on a pro rata basis so, uh, uh, than, than you might otherwise have negotiated. So uh, we recommend this resolution. Any further discussion? Roll call. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbic? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Number three, resolution 2020-079, authorizing a supplemental resolution for $250,000 in motor fuel tax funds to general maintenance section 20.00000-00-GM under the applicable provisions of the Illinois Highway Code from January 1, 2020 through December 31, 2020. Motion, please. So, second. It's been moved by Alderman Favor, seconded by Alderman Smith. City Manager Nicholas, please. Well, I, I said that we've been taking a pretty hard hit uh, from the COVID crisis on our general operations, but. Uh, as we said, or as we talked earlier uh, in the public hearing, we received some additional money from uh, the federal government for our CDBG program. We've also, we, at the last meeting, talked about some additional MFT money specifically for roadway improvements. Now this is specifically for sidewalk improvements. We took out about the same amount of sidewalk improvements from the uh, 2020 annual street maintenance program, which usually has a sidewalk uh, uh, companion with it. As you know, uh, partly because we didn't anticipate this, but we've got it now through the state uh, Department of Transportation. And so uh, we've, uh, we'd offer uh, this for your approval. Uh, uh, we, have, we had planned on doing this work, uh, so we have plans ready to go. Uh, the, uh, 
uh, rate a bid, and, and we'd like to proceed and get it done this year. Includes, by the way, a number of ADA uh, sidewalk and you know, repairs and improvements. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Morris? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Number four, resolution 2020-080, approving a substantial amendment to the Community Development Block Grant CDBG Annual Action Plan one-year use of funds for program year 27. That's April 1, 2020 through March 31, 2021, to include CARES Act funding to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus in the amount of $271,899 and the reallocation of $25,000 of 2019 public facilities funding to fund an optional relocation assistance program. I'd entertain a motion to approve, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Morris, seconded by Alderman McAdams. City Manager. Thank you. Uh, this is the action item that flows from the public hearing at the top of the agenda. And I will say that uh, Joanne Rouse has been very prudent and meticulous in trying to spread this money where it can do the most good uh, in the least amount of time. And as you see in that chart, uh, I replicated the chart on page 10. So Elder Care Services, Hope Haven, uh, there are amounts there to help with uh, protective clothing, uh, cleaning supplies, uh, hand washing stations and the like, and some additional help also for Safe Passage, which is a recipient uh, otherwise during the year. But Family Service Agency, which is now running the county's community action program, as you well know, many of you, or if all, I'm sure all of you know, uh, are seeing uh, a, a spike up uh, from persons who have lost their, their employment, are experiencing other difficulties as a result of COVID, uh, are in need of rent mortgage payment assistance. We've had some calls at City Hall and we haven't had that available uh, to give. Um, and uh, the, the healthiest part of this amount is going into those types of programs. There will be uh, also some money uh, unallocated that can be retained for uh, needs that we are going to uh, almost certainly identify as we start giving out some money and engaging families that are having troubles that we hadn't even imagined. So I, I think this is a, a very uh, good use of, of that $250,000 and would recommend your approval, or 271000 excuse me. Any further discussion? Yeah, I know Dawn Littlefield from the United Way in releasing her report, or quarterly report on the 211 system, said without a doubt the number one reason folks were calling were for some rental uh, and housing assistance, for sure. So this certainly addresses that. Roll call, please. Finucan? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Number five, conditional approval in omnibus form authorizing agreements with local social service agencies for community development block grant year 2020 CARES Act CDBG CV funding to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus as follows. Resolution 2020-081, Elder Care Services, $10,000. Resolution 20-082, Hope Haven, $25,000. Resolution 2020-083, Safe Passage, $15,000. And Resolution 2020-084, Family Service Agency, $175,000 for a total amount of $225,000. I'd entertain a motion, please. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved by Alderman McAdams, seconded by Alderman Favor. City Manager Nicholas. This is a companion piece to the resolution you just approved. Right. This will expedite the release of the monies mm -hmm. under new provisions uh, owing to the uh, COVID um, CARES Act. So, 
Good. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbic? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. That motion, that resolution passes. Number six, resolution 2020-085, authorizing a master lease purchase agreement with tax-exempt leasing corporation for lease financing of a utility department four-wheel drive loader in the amount of $203,190.60. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Been moved by Alderman McAdams, seconded by Alderman Smith. City Manager Nicholas. Uh, also to his credit, Brian Favor is a pretty good negotiator when it comes to going for uh, tax exempt uh, leasing for uh, our, our equipment. And uh, when he got back from his, his very brief vacation, he jumped on this for us and uh, negotiated uh, lease payments uh, with no down payment and an uh, interest rate of 2.6% of over a five year term for this John Deere loader, which you uh, supported the acquisition of, but we left open whether we could find uh, a good lease uh, term for it or, or we would have to look at paying outright. We did have the money out to pay for it outright, but then that would have depleted the overall fund for uh, f payments. Uh, and this is one of the things I'll be presenting you as part of the budget process, what, where we stand and what we have left uh, for the next round of, of fleet upgrades and so forth. So. I think, you know, we, this is a strategy, obviously. We're, we're, we're trying not to spend everything down, but we have to watch as we're building up our, our interest uh, payments uh, that will be eating into some of the available assets we have. So there's going to be a balance point this year and next year, and we'll try every year to hit a sweet spot that allows us to do either or, depending on the type of equipment about right a little bit of leasing it's going to be a mix I think as we go some years out um, if we just lease and lease the heck out of our fleet we'll finally come up to the point where we have no more money to do the leasing so uh, we'll, we'll we'll work on it but for this moment this is the right way to go I think we have a motion on the floor and a second to approve this lease arrangement and lease agreement any further discussion roll call please McAdams yes Verbic? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Smith? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. That resolution passes. Our last resolution of the evening is resolution 2020-086, authorizing a funding request from Barb City Manor, excuse me, from Barb City Manor for the installation of a new elevator system. I'd entertain a motion, please. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderman McAdams. Uh, prior to City Manager Nicholas making a uh, report on this, uh, Maureen Garrity, the Executive Director of the uh, Barb City Manor, is on the Zoom. Did you want to say anything at this point, Maureen? No, I'm just here if council have any questions. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see if they do. City Manager Nicholas. Thank you. I want to thank Maureen, first of all, for very kind comments about our city workers. And I'm, I'm glad they were able to make the repairs and that uh, the residents are, are content with the results. Uh, separately, uh, unfortunately, uh, Barb City Manor has a couple of elevators that are in need of, of serious repair. Uh, and thanks to Maureen's very ju judicious uh, fiscal management, uh, we found a way to help them uh, with the improvements that need to be made. And these, this is gonna be a long-term payoff, but we have a 10-year lease and it's a $50,000 a, a year city payment. So what they're asking is that this year and next year we dedicate those payments. We haven't done anything yet to dedicate payment toward these elevator repairs, and there may be more after that, but for now, that's the commitment that we're asking for, 2020 and 2021. Thank you. Are there any questions of Maureen Garrity or of City Manager Nicholas regarding uh, this uh, request? 
If not, roll call. Vervik? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. That resolution passes. Thank you, Maureen, for being with us tonight via Zoom. Thank you so much. Okay, now we have ordinances. We have no ordinances tonight for on second reading. We do have several on first reading. If you recall, we did uh, entertain a uh, motion and approve that we take L1, L2, and L3 in omnibus form. That was approved, so I'm going to read these in omnibus form uh, as requested by Alderman Finucane. And then I'm going to have City Manager Nicholas make any appropriate comments that he might like to. Of course, these all relate to the public hearing that we had uh, in the earlier part of the meeting. So this ordinance would read thusly, Ordinance 2020-046, approving an annexation and development agreement with the DeKalb First United Methodist Church to allow for construction of an approximately 7,730 square foot church and accessory uses for approximately 16 acres of property located along the west side of North Annie Glidden Road across from the DeKalb County Health Facility campus. This ordinance would also approve the annexation of certain property to the city of DeKalb, First United, DeKalb First United Methodist Church. And this would approve the zoning petition by DeKalb First United Methodist Church to rezone certain property along the west side of North Annie Glidden Road from SFR1, Single Family Residential District, to the PDR, Planned Development Residential District, approving an amendment to Ordinance 1994-074 and approving the concept plan, architectural elevations, landscape plan and plat of dedication to allow for the development of an approximately 7,730 square foot church and accessory uses. DeKalb First United Methodist Church. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Finucane, seconded by Alderman Favor, City Manager Nicholas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And Thanks to Alderman Finucane for uh, combining these because we're talking about them together. It's, mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense that we would do this. The, the annexation and development agreement is, is much detailed and it lays out a lot of the expectations that we talked about in the public hearing. The uh, annexation itself is, is to be approved uh, provided the annexation and development ordinance is approved and that's part of the omnibus package you have now. Uh, unless there was some other information you're aware of that hasn't been entered into the public uh, discussion so far, and I don't think there is. And then finally, the, the rezoning, which also includes the concept plan as the mayor read, uh, the title and architectural elevations, as you know, there's, there is uh, a request for a waiver there, uh, and, uh, and uh, landscaping and so forth, uh, and that is part of this uh, final uh, rezoning package, and we feel that this this has been a, a much discussed, a well negotiated, albeit a long negotiation, but a well negotiated uh, uh, package uh, and, and uh, provisions, and we feel that this would be a, a great addition to the northwest side of DeKalb. Any discussion? I'd simply like to reiterate too what a couple of members of the First United Methodist Church told me. They were so pleased with working with City Manager Nicholas and our principal planner, Dan Olson. And so Dan, thank you very, very much for shepherding this through planning and zoning and, and hopefully uh, our vote will be in the affirmative tonight. Uh, thank you, City Manager Nicholas. I should, I should make a point for the record, though, to say that the Planning and Zoning Commission has also spent a fair amount of time on this uh, and has uh, unanimously supported uh, all three of these uh, Precisely. actions uh, by a vote of six to zero. Uh, Alderman Nemoris. I just want to note that um, we had support of some of the pastors during our 
strategic planning sessions with the community services group uh, for the Annie Glidden North corridor. So it really meant a lot up front to have them present at that strategic planning, um, demonstrating well in advance of their relocation that they intended to invest in the area. So that really meant a lot to me. And I'm sure it means a lot to the residents of the area. Thank you, Carolyn. Any other comments? Roll call. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. That's a unanimous vote. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move that we uh, waive second reading and approve this omnibus ordinance. So this, okay. become, this could become more unanimous. I have a motion on the floor that we waive second reading and approve. I need a second. Second. Seconded by Alderman Smith. Any further discussion? Roll call. Morris? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. That ordinance is approved as presented. Thank you. Number four, ordinance 2020-049, amending chapter 51 traffic schedule Q speed restrictions as it pertains to the reduction of the speed limit for Gurler Road from the east city limits to the west city limits. I'd entertain a motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderman Morris. McAdams. Morris. 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 What did I say? Alderman Morris. Alderman Morris, did you make the second? second. Yeah. <laughs> so it's Alderman Smith made the motion, Alderman Morris made the second. Yeah. City Manager Nicholas, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the request to reduce the speed on this section of Gurler uh, comes from Farrar and Facebook, but also after consultation with our uh, city engineer, Zach Gill, and the county highway engineer, and the DeKalb and Afton Township Road Commissioners. Uh, this is that stretch that goes from 4th and Gurler east to a point just east of where Peace Road currently intersects with Gurler and where the township uh, jurisdiction begins. And uh, for our section, it would be 35. And then it goes uh, another distance and under the, uh, the, the protocols of the county and the township, it goes from 35, not back up to 55, but 35 to a stretch that's gonna be 45. And then as, as you're heading toward um, Salmonock, I guess it goes to 55 briefly, and then it goes down to 45. <laughs> but I think that'll all change as as the traffic is identified and how what impacts it has. But this this is needed now, just for the construction, and we do have some people who aren't thinking, and they come up on it. There are a few instances in the course of the day where you don't see heavy equipment, and they're speeding through here. That's not safe. So we support this, and hope you will too. Okay, Alderman Finucane. Just a question, what's the effective date of implementation here? Uh, I think it's immediate, isn't it, or is it 10 days? Is it immediate? The ordinance is probably 10 days. 10 days. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? Roll call. Finucane? Yes. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. That ordinance is uh, okayed on first reading. Move to waive. <laughs> you, want to, you want me to write out the language for you? Yeah. Move to waive, waive second, second reading, reading. And, and approve. approve. <laughs> second. Thank you. It's been moved by Alderman Morris, seconded by Alderman Favor, that we waive second reading on this uh, consideration and approve. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Smith? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. That ordinance is approved as presented. Okay, now we move to the 
One of the last items on our regular agenda tonight, that's reports and communication. This allows any of our council members uh, and our city manager to uh, make any reports or communicate anything to the public that they would like. And we'll start with our first ward alderman, Carolyn Morris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just really briefly, I've had a few questions about uh, repaving of Twombly Road lately, and I just want to clarify in case I may have miscommunicated the timeline on that project. Um, currently, Twombly's utility work is being done, and that will be done this year, and next year is when we expect to have um, repaving and sidewalks completed and that'll be work done by the county so I just want to make sure that people understand when that's happening it is not on the back burner it is currently underway um, it's just taking a little bit of time that's all thank you Alderman Morris any anything else that's all thank you our second word Alderman B Bill Fanukin well you know two weeks ago I sat up here and talked about the uh, uh, COVID virus and, and its impacts. Well, immediately after the meeting, I learned that earlier that day I had been exposed to an individual who was showing symptoms, uh, or right afterwards was began showing symptoms. And I'm just coming out of the two-week quarantine tonight. This is the first I've been out. And so I want to reiterate what I said a couple of weeks ago about please wear your mask, wear it correctly, keep your nose and your mouth covered. You know, we're seeing increases. You know, we've heard about Florida, we've heard about California and Arizona, but there's certain parts of Illinois now that are undergoing an increase mm -hmm. too. And uh, please cooperate, wear your mask, not only in stores, but when you're out in public, wear it. Um, you may notice that, you know, my mask is on the whole time up here. Uh, you'll see other people. And if you haven't heard already today that already Major League Baseball, they had to cancel several games today because of COVID uh, intervention. Uh, the Miami uh, Marlins, I understand, have had 14 people test positive here today. Mm. And so you can see, even with all the protocols they're undergoing, that it's still spreading. So please protect yourself, protect others as much as you can. It's very important. Use the hand sanitizer, wear your mask, wash your hands, and uh, keep your distance at a social, reasonable six to eight feet. Thank you very much. Third Ward, Alderman Tracy Smith. Uh, two things. Uh, thank you to Mr. Trevat. Uh, I've been waiting to hear from Mr. Nicholas on the Finance Committee before planning the Third Ward, as well as from Zach Gill, our Ed City Engineer, on the progress of 7th Street before I had a ward meeting because I've been fielding a lot of calls about that. All positive. I think people are just anxious. The second thing is uh, uh, thank you to the Police Department. Been a little rough, wait. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Alderman Smith. Uh, sixth, uh, fifth Ward Alderman Scott McAdams. I've heard from a number of Fifth Ward residents that they're very distressed over the number of trees that the city has taken down uh, at the behest of uh, Commonwealth Edison. Uh, we have an ash borer problem in the Fifth Ward, and the residents would like a plan for replanting. Uh, talking to Andy. Uh, it looks like there's a, some, a budgetary issue. So as we approach budgets uh, in November, let's consider uh, that this, many of these residents are very, would very much like to see um, trees replanted in that area. Thank you, Alderman McAdams. Uh, Sixth Ward Alderman Mike Verbeck. Ward 6 had a very productive uh, ward meeting last week and uh, so productive that it's leading to another Ward 6 meeting. This one will be virtual on Wednesday, August 5th at 6 o'clock. Look forward to talking with everyone then. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Tony Favor of our 7th Ward. I have no report this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I have a couple of items before we uh, are, uh, are asked to uh, recess into executive session. Uh, one is tomorrow evening, the DeKalb <coughs> Municipal Band will continue uh, over 160 continuous years. And through the efforts of band director uh, Kirk Lundbeck and uh, the DeKalb Park District and the Egyptian Theater for ticketing and a number of other folks, uh, the municipal band through a social distancing within the band shell and within the, on the stage itself uh, 
will be able to uh, start tomorrow evening, 7.30. I think they're gonna have four concerts over the next uh, uh, four Tuesday evenings. And just a note that one of our uh, longtime city residents and uh, well-loved in, uh, in the business uh, of uh, uh, dispensing drugs is pharmacist Ann Lehan who this Friday will be completing 40 years of full-time service for her family operation. Uh, she is retiring. Uh, apparently she's gonna work a little bit of part-time, but she's gonna be retiring. And this Friday from 12 to two, there's gonna be a drive-through congratulations for Ann Lehan down at their 4th Street store. So if anyone would like to uh, Say congratulations and best wishes to Ann Lehan. You can do that on Friday or stop in or send her a card or something like that. City Manager Nicholas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, uh, I think I would just say one thing. There was a comment made earlier tonight about why doesn't the city just call up contractors and encourage them, I think was the word, to bid. That would be called bid rigging in the state of Illinois. You can call a contractor and ask if they've received their, their bid documents, but that's about it. And we don't like to do that because the next comment back from the contractor is, hey, I'd like to ask you a few questions about this since you're on the line. And that leads you down a, a, a dark path. So um, just to clarify, that's what we don't want to do. Thanks. I was in the printing business for 30 years, and I know the bid process situation. And I know the temptation at times to get other bids. Mm -hmm. But you know, there is an integrity that we as individuals and we as council members and we as a city have to the integrity of the bidding process. And I felt very, very uncomfortable initially when we did not award a bid at our last meeting. Having said that, what we did tonight in rebidding the operation makes total sense to me. So I appreciate the remarks of uh, the public, especially if the public educates themselves in terms of what it is that particular bids and specs go. And Brian Faber, I appreciate all the work that you put in. Uh, after we wrestled with this a couple of weeks ago uh, and approved what we did tonight. So I do appreciate your work on that, the city manager, Nicholas. Uh, Executive Assistant Ruth Scott, do you have anything? No, sir, no report. Okay, and I don't believe uh, City Clerk Fazekas is with us. I do not see her name on the screen. Okay. So with that, I would ask for approval to hold an exec to recess and go into executive session uh, on advice of council due to the fact that Zoom is not a totally secure format. We will have to ask those who are in Zoom uh, to be excused and we will, as we move into executive session into this room. Uh, and so I appreciate all of you on Zoom tonight but we will be concluding this meeting as we move into recess. I would ask a motion to hold the executive session. And the executive session will discuss the following. Number one, the purchase or lease of real property, land acquisition, as provided for in 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 C5. Number two, real estate as provided for in 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 C6, and three, pending or imminent litigation as provided for in 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 C11. I'd entertain a motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderman Morris, seconded by Alderman Favor, that we recess into executive session. Any further discussion? Roll call. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Manukin? Yes. Smith? Yes. Mayor Smith? Yes. Seven yes. 
That motion passes. We are now in recess for executive session.